This message is brought to you by Spirion. The data privacy revolution is the new age of protecting what matters most. Automatically and persistently discover and classify sensitive data with the most accurate solution on the planet. Understand the data within the context of your business and then take actions to control that data so you can operate with minimal friction and comply with the laws and regulations built to protect the personal data privacy of individuals across the globe. This is Spirion, protecting what matters most. Visit them on the web at securityweekly.com forward slash Spirion. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from zero to a hundred. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome back, everyone. And just a quick announcement. We have officially migrated our mailing list to a new platform. Sign up for the new list. Receive invites to our virtual trainings, webcast, and other relative content to your interest by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe and clicking the join the list button. You can also submit your suggestions for guests coming on the show at securityweekly.com forward slash guests. Submit that form and tell us who you want to see on the show and we'll try and get them. Uh, we'll review them each month, uh, which, which we do, and determine if they're a good fit or not. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mark Cooper. He's the president and founder of PKI Solutions. Is known as the PKI guy since his early days at Microsoft. He has deep knowledge and experience in all things PKI infrastructure and is here today to talk about robocalls. Mark, welcome to the program. Hey, guys. How are you doing? We're doing fantastic. We, um, it, it's kind of interesting. We all have this problem. Uh, those of us in security, oh, those of us in IT, those of us in software. And basically, if you're a human being on this planet today and you've got a phone, you've probably gotten a robocall or 16 uh, in the today. past. Uh, yeah, today, perhaps. <laughs> I, 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 I'm one of those folks that still has an actual, quote, landline phone. Yeah, I have one um, of those, too. And there, were, there are two people, two actual people, aside from a couple of my wife's Avon people yep. that call it. <clears throat> and it was my mother-in-law and my mom. Right. So now there's only one, one. person that legitimately <laughs> calls it. And that phone rings 30 plus times a day. Really? Yep. Yeah. No, I've got thing. I call it the shit catcher. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah that's exactly. It's like you, you have that email address that you use for all those places that you know you're going to get spam for. You use that one email address. I still have a Yahoo address. And, for it. That's that phone number. What I find interesting, yeah. and, and Mark, I wanted to get this out there before we set it up because it's kind of like the elephant in the room because all of us have smartphones, right? And largely we send text messages to each other. And yep. if someone calls you without sending a text message first, they're like shamed. <laughs> they're like, how dare you? So when your phone actually rings without the text message being sent first, uh, it tends to be almost always a spam call. And uh, there's lots of regulations for other forms of communication. Um, and, and I'm not sure, Mark, I guess my opening question for you is, uh, why are robocalls so popular today? Well, I, th I think what we found is that there's been a, a lot of advancement in protection mechanisms for things like email and, and, and web communications. And uh, telephony has been around for a long time and has been largely forgotten about. Uh, it's a really low barrier to entry. So, so now if you're trying to elicit um, crimes or, or just steal identity information or just sell something, it's really cheap to do. And, and that used to be what we had with email. And now people have gotten really smart about emails and filtering and service providers. So that barrier to entry is still there for uh, phone calls today. That's it's really interesting. If you think about it. I thought it, it was just nostalgia. <laughs> well, and, you know, and I, also, I, you know, I think GDPR... Um, was also one of the more recent triggers because, and we experienced that here on Security Week, we've talked about it, is that, uh, you know, the uh, adding people to list, emailing them, even from the email providers, uh, you know, mailing list providers um, are, are really strict about what you can do. In fact, we're leaving an yeah. email list provider and going back to our original one 
because they were so ridiculous. We're like, no, we, we've had these right. people's permission to send them email for a really long time. You know what they said? They actually said, well, prove it. We want the logs. We want the IP addresses and the original data that you had permission. And I'm like, yeah. you're on crack. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, and, but also with GDPR, you can't send people email and keep them on a list because of the regulations, but there's no regulations on calling people. And that's where we're getting yeah. more robocalls, right? It's one reason, Mark, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And I, th I think what you'll see, whether it's a phone call or an email, frankly, the people who are doing the, the robocalling and, and spamming, uh, they're not following the rules anyway. So yes, uh, yes. It's, it's not like they're, they're going somewhere else. Uh, but but they do find it harder. You know, you try to go into MailChimp, for instance, and, and upload a bunch of contacts. They're going to go, well, right. these, these look nefarious. Well, ma and and MailChimp is pretty good. They've been our provider for for a long time and that's the one we're actually moving back to is mail oh, sure. they're fair they're yeah. fair about it yeah yeah they do but they, they are checking i mean they're they're looking to make it harder for spammers to do things that right. they shouldn't which which they should do um but ironically there, there's been very little changes to the way that telephony works because it's, it's been around forever um that it's it's been very easy for them to go back to to doing phone calls it, and it's very personal one-to-one. -one. I mean, email, in, in many ways, we, we've gotten used to having a detachment when it comes in and you're naturally yep. on guard. The phone rings, and until this has really become a problem, people were kind of already in a, a comforted state because th there's a one-to-one -one conversation that's implied there. Absolutely. Um, so are, do you, like, educate people, Mark, and work on, like, how you protect your phone number or... Have we largely like given up on that for most of the general population? And I know folks like us, we've had Michael Bazell on the show, and he very intelligently talked about the you know, you can create multiple phone numbers for yourself, but I almost feel like you have to start there. It's hard to kind of get sure. away from it, right? But you can, yeah. you know, have more kind of public numbers and then more private numbers and things like that. But I, I think kind of the cat's out of the bag, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I think there's there's those types of, of common processes. And, you know, we even have you no know, uh, fake emails that we never hand out and they still wind up on lists. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think the good news, and, and this is a place where we've been talking for the last uh, year or so, is that there's actually a new global standard to fight the, the robocall and caller ID spoofing. And um, it, it, there's a really interesting security implication there. Mm -hmm but it helps to solve a, a big problem. And, and a good analogy is often trying to think about creating firewalls and firewall rules when there's no IP addresses and no standard ports. Right. Um, that's kind of where telephony is. Now, how, do you, how do you protect these things? And this new global standard is really designed to make that consistently easier to identify. And then there's other ways to, to mitigate um, and, and frankly, Part of the problem is there there are valid robocalls and there are valid times where spoofing a caller ID, uh, whether it's a, a, a university trying to alert all of its students right. about a school closure, th that, that's a robocall. Uh, that's just a fact. But the intent of a robocall like that versus somebody who's you know trying to uh, get financial information or sell something uh, in a, a territory is, is very different. Yeah. So, I, I mean, suffice it to say, uh, in terms of just protecting ourselves, before we get to some of the standards uh, and, and kind of some of the more technical stuff, which I'm, we're very interested in, in terms of protecting yourself, you know, how much do you, do you change your phone number? Do you have different phone numbers? Do you use the, you know, true caller and other style apps? Or is that really just not going to be that effective? Yeah, I, I think it's a, a bit like email. You could probably switch to a new phone number and, and maybe have a period of time where uh, you, you'll get some relief. But but honestly, if you jump to a number, it's probably a number somebody just moved off of as well. So, right. You're going to get um, someone else to spam. Getting, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So you're right back in the same boat. And there's supposed to be some waiting period, cooling down periods that, that happen with phone numbers. Um, but I don't think you're going to get a lot of relief there. Um, I, I know one of the things that we often recommend is the most of the, the telephony providers have some type of analytical app that does a reasonably good job. Um, so for instance, on my cellular provider, I was able to install the app on my phone and it, it does some back end work, but mm -hmm. it's actually able to detect a lot of those fraudulent calls um, and, and, and alert me at least, no, this is a risky call or it's a, a spam call and some are just blocked outright. So th there are some mechanisms that are available today. Um, and even the landline providers that you know, we uh, have service through our cable company at the house uh, kind of same thing. We don't use the number very much, uh, but even they have a, a service that you can optionally enable that does some of those same analytical things and trying to screen out those calls. Right. 
it, it, I mean, it's to the point now, Mark, where it's really hard to determine whether or not you're going to answer your phone, like whether that call is legitimate or not. And there's, I mean, we've all had this, right? It's your doctor's office. It's, you know, your dentist or whoever. It could be a legitimate call, but the caller ID looks kind of weird because they're using a bank of numbers and it's pulling from a bank that, you know, we've already said, Mark, like the number's been recycled and that's coming with a different caller ID, but that was a call I wanted. Um, exactly. Well, what can you do as an organization that does have to call people for legitimate reasons to make it seem more more legitimate so that people actually do answer the call? Well, th there's probably not a whole lot that you can do. Um, probably the best thing you do, uh, though, is is try to have some number consistency. So a lot of the, the telephone providers are capturing analytics and, and data based on how a call goes through. Does it go to voicemail? Is it picked up? How long does the call go? Um, and some of them um, actually elicit permission from um, their subscribers to allow them to listen to the voicemail to find out what the intent was. So the more consistent you, you use a number, you almost kind of build up a reputation. And if that is seen as, as positive, you have a high pickup rate or, or consistent as opposed to a downward trending, mm -hmm. um, then some of those analytical apps will, will give a better sign to, to customers. Um, but beyond that, you know, uh, frankly, it happens to, to, to all of us. Um, I, I had one today where I literally told my brother I was going to call him. He thought for my cell number, I called for my VoIP number, which is the same area code and prefix, and he still didn't answer it. Mm -hmm. It's true. We're all in heightened alert. Yep. Sometimes I don't answer the phone just because I don't like talking to people. That's a, that's a valid point, Jeff. I, yeah. <clears throat> well, I, yeah, I was expecting I that when I said it was my brother. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so, uh, tell us about uh, Shaken and, and Stir. Is that a good place yeah. to start with in terms of technology and protocols and, and governance to help solve this problem? I, I think so. And and probably the, the easiest thing to, to do is, is to talk a little bit about uh, the problem it's trying to solve, what it is, and then um, the limitations of it. So when you look at the problem around robocalls and, and caller ID, I, I mentioned already that there are some legitimate purposes there. But the, the biggest problem today is the fact that the, the originator of a call is a very difficult thing to assert. And, and it really kind of goes back to the, the early days of caller ID, where the assumption was that there's a, a large physical switch sitting in a, a telephone provider, and uh, they stick a uh, caller ID number in there and it goes out. It, it was inserted by the telephone company, so it must be valid. Well, now we have I, when like you say that, switches. Mark, I envision, uh, you know, from like TVs, older TVs and movies and such, where there's the it, back then, it was uh, ladies who were like actually physically pulling cables from one port well, to almost, the other and connecting people. <laughs> almost, almost. You know, if you think back to when caller ID really kind of came about in the U.S., we kind of saw it in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, it, it was still uh, analog systems. The operators weren't quite there plugging things in, but they were the, the old giant analog systems taking up massive rooms. Mm. Uh, every city had some type of large switch infrastructure. Uh, and caller ID was kind of this bolt-on thing. And, and if you really want to geek out, it, it's almost like a little bit of a, a side tone modulated uh, modem that sits uh, alongside the, the, the phone call signaling. And it would send along ASCII information on what the, the caller ID was. Mm -hmm. um, so it was this bolt-on technology. Um, when we started to see things like SIP and, and, and uh, the ability to have a, a switch on a laptop or, or VoIP providers, that concept of a switch changed. And, and now it was up to whoever's running that software to say what their caller ID is. Well, and then the fairest hands, they jump around. So before we could really talk about how, how do we stop robocalls, the, the big problem is how do we know who's making the call mm. so that we can have some consistent analytics around it? And that, that's where Shake and Stir comes in. And uh, this is a, a standard that was adopted by the telecom industry last year that basically assigns a digital identity to every call that's placed that asserts what the phone number is. And that actually comes from the telephone company. So regardless of what kind of switch or software uh, uh, a company is running, the telephone provider puts it back in. And then to make sure it's trusted, it's going to digitally sign it with a signing certificate that's validated on the recipient's end. How, how does the recipient validate that? Do they go back to the provider? 
Yeah, so this is all provider side. There, there is a intent uh, for the a device side, but the intent is uh, if I'm a subscriber of, of one telephone company, they would assert and, and sign that phone call uh, with my caller ID. It gets received by the recipient's phone company. They reverse the process. They validate the signing certificate. They look at the, the phone number, and then that's what's passed along in the caller ID. The intent is hopefully uh, handset manufacturers, whether it's Android or, or iOS, would have a different physical and visual display of a verified call versus I was, an unverified call. I was going to ask that. I never considered this. Yeah. When you go to a website yeah. and you get the SSL certificate exactly. validation, we've seen the progression yeah. over time as to how they're validated. Yeah. There's nothing like that on the phones today. It, it, exactly. Exactly. So the distinction right now is you don't necessarily know if it's a valid ID. Um, it, it could even be a case when you think about the fact that you could spoof an ID. If I happen to know your, your, your mom or your dad's phone number, if I call you with that, my caller ID, your phone is going to probably pull up the record, oh, maybe yeah. even show their ID, even though it's not really them at all. Whereas the intent with this verified caller ID is that the handset manufacturer at, at their own discretion could choose how they want to indicate that to you because they would get signaling that said this was a verified or unverified call. It's really funny when we, largely when we first started the podcast, Larry, and maybe even before that, I mean, how many calls do we get from the White House? I mean, the president <laughs> wanted to talk to us like a, a lot. lot. A lot. Yes, yes. <laughs> like back when we used to uh, you know, ask people to call in and we put pins on a frapper map. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 those were the days, right? <laughs> and, and, yeah. and we called one of our listeners back and got his voicemail. He got his voicemail. Yeah, the, Kevin, the whole thing. Yeah. Kevin Ameren. Yes. Yes. Wow, that's really interesting. cool. So now, wh where are we with with shaken in stir today? Like, what yeah. kind of adoption have we seen, and, and what potential does it has, and how do we push it forward? Sure. So the the good thing is it was uh, developed by the industry, so that the telecoms themselves are, are already bought in. Uh, there's a global uh, standards body that kind of governs it. When you really think about telephony, uh, it's 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 like the internet. It's it's an interconnected set of, of providers. They all have to agree on how things are signaled. So the good news is we don't have to worry about convincing phone providers to do it. Um, we are at a little bit of a disadvantage in that the way that the standard was written is it's up to each country to choose how they're going to enforce or implement it. So just because it's a technical standard doesn't mean they have to do it. Mm. Um, just like a country doesn't have to implement caller ID, but if they do, here, here's the, the process they're going to do it. In the U.S., we did uh, just get a law passed called the TRACE Act, T-R-A-C-E-D, at the beginning of the year that does instruct the FCC to mandate a verified caller process um, that is essentially shake and stir. It, it was written mm -hmm. specific to that, along with some other provisions that are in there. So we're expecting in 2020 to see the majority of providers um, implementing this. In fact, this is already happening on the majority of um, networks today. So, so the, oh, sorry, Mark, I just want to go back. So there is a, a U.S. federal law that was passed that providers have to implement this. Yes. Now, there's a timeline to implementation. Sure. It, it basically yeah. provides about 18 to 24 months for it. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're seeing is a lot of the providers are already doing this. So uh, within the networks of most major providers, they're already doing this uh, signing and caller ID verification, because if the call originates with themselves and terminates within the same network, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a trusted source. So, so they're, they're going through the mechanisms. Uh, we also see a limited amount of kind of peer-to-peer uh, collaboration and testing where provider A will mm -hmm. you know, get with provider B and you know, exchange some self-signed certificates and, and do some testing and, and, and sign calls back and forth between each other. Um, so it, it, it's, it's in place, but I suspect 2020 is where we will start to see the majority of providers uh, implement this. There is a sticky wicket here, and, and, this, this, and the sticky thing is because it's country by country, um, if I'm a nefarious person, I just change my VoIP service somewhere else. I'll, I'll just pick up my line. All the providers in the U.S. have implemented it. I'll connect with some service that is in Afghanistan. And when my calls go out, they're not signed. They're yeah. still routed through and, yes, they'll show up as untrusted. It, it, this goes for landline, cellular, or VoIP, correct? 
Exactly. Um, there, there are some technical challenges when we get uh, in, into the process of, of digital versus analog transmission of, of the calls behind the scenes. Um, and, and strangely enough, uh, in interesting discoveries, no one really knows what percentage of calls originate as a SIP transaction and yeah. end as a SIP transaction hmm. with no um, analog transmission in between. Um, even the big players don't quite know, uh, much hmm. like on the internet, you don't necessarily know each individual segment between you and a website. It's, it's, it's just crazy to think about when you describe that. I, I, I started listening I might, to it. I might know somebody that knows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it's interesting uh, but, talking to some of the, the providers. You know, they're, they're right. senior technical fellows that have been involved in this for 40 years. They, you know, the, the telephone companies have always operated on this uh, shared costing model where my responsibility ends halfway to the next provider. Uh, what happens beyond there, I, I, I don't quite know. Um, so a lot of them really don't have much visibility beyond not even the next provider, but halfway down the wire. Uh, I was uh, started reading a new book based on Corey Thune's recommendation. Oh no, it wasn't Corey Thune. It was Dan from PlexTrack uh, recommended Cyber Spies, and they start at the very beginning, and they started at World War One, just before World War One started. It was telegraphs, and mm -hmm. the British back then, the Britons, right, were uh, sent a boat out to dredge up some cables and cut them. And those were the telegraph lines into Germany. And they yep. were essentially cutting off all of their communications to the outside world. The scenario we just described, like, you know, the landlines to cellular to internet, uh, that is totally infeasible today. And now we talk about the validation of that, right? Back when there was much less infrastructure, much more, uh, much easier to verify today, you know, it's, you know, all bets are off. It, it, exactly. It, it, it's really kind of the, the moving of that security boundary from what used to be inside of a giant vault inside mm -hmm. of a, a switch that was millions and millions of dollars. Um, and we just had copper wires that came in and we did signaling off of there. Now it's like I could completely replace a, a, a service provider with my laptop in a, a digital switch. Right. Signals intelligence was much easier back then too, Jeff, because they essentially just had hundreds of people reading all of the telegraphs. And that was before radio, <laughs> just before radio, or around the time of radio communications. Yeah. Th thank you for not uh, joking that I was there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been the go. next logical step. <laughs> it would have been. Um, so yeah, but I was gonna, I was gonna make that joke, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, Je Jeff was just in the room where they did with the operators, and he, he was a yeah. little plug. Yeah. He had a tap. Well, so it's funny. Right into his tap. You know, you talked about, you know, old movies where you remember the women pulling cables. But, you know, I, I've been doing a little bit of, of research because I'm, I'm giving a talk tomorrow uh, with Ron Gula. And he wants me to do a history of, of uh, breaches and compromises. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, and he wants me to start with the cuckoo's egg. Uh, when Cliff Stahl was, was basically inventing forensics and trying to track down who the hackers were that had broken into his university's mainframe, I mean, his idea of of doing you know capture and, and trying to to sniff the traffic and, and and trying to trace back who was the callers. I mean, he was literally running around with a with a cart with a machine with yeah. the cables and patching them a, a manually. So it, you know, it, it's not just the '50s. That was in the '80s. We were still pulling cables to to connect phone calls. Right. This whole episode has been very nostalgic for me. Yes. <laughs> yes. No. I completely agree. Um, I just want to. I just want to say Tone Loke. It's not, it's yes. not a rap star. No. 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 It was. It was a program. Uh, uh, a war dialer, essentially. Mm -hmm. One of the first ones, if not maybe the first one. Uh, yep. But you know, it's interesting. We and we talk about war dialing, and we talk about uh, you know some of the older technology. We we always had this problem, Mark, of how do we, and it's the same problem we have with users and authentication and passwords to websites. How do we verify that you're really who you say you are, right? Yeah. yeah. And shaking the store, it, 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 it sounds like it does some of that, but not really, right? 
Well, it, 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 it is kind of the same thing, which which is actually why we got involved. So, you know, we are specialists in, in public key infrastructure, which is basically certificates for encryption and identity, uh, which is actually why the, the shake and stir standard was written that way, is if we want to identify who someone is, there's actually pieces of information that are already present, but how do we keep it from changing? So mm. much like we, we don't wanna necessarily pass passwords around a network and we're doing things like Kerberos tokens, which are representations and are actually, if you look at them, much like a certificate, what Shake and Stir is doing is saying, hey, if, if, if we could identify who is originating a call and then digitally sign it, then we know that wherever it goes through, whatever transmission through whatever provider, we know who placed the call, the identity portion. And by making sure that it's a trusted source that's signing it, so these uh, providers have to go through a vetting process and be trusted to do the signing, we know that there's a reasonable level of assurance. So again, we're right back to kind of network things. How do we have assurance on who's getting the identity? How do we keep the identities from changing? And then the other side is just because we have the identity, we don't necessarily know if that's a valid robocaller or a, a, a spammer. Just like when somebody shows up to our network, sometimes we have to use analytics to figure out what are they doing, what are they accessing, what are they retrieving. That's where some of the existing analytics will get better because we'll have consistent data about a particular identity and who's placing the calls. Uh, Jeff. So, so you're saying, oh, hey, you're hang saying on, telephony has Tyler, Tyler, <laughs> Tyler, wait your turn. Hold on, man. Jeff, and then Tyler. Uh, well, I wanted to go off on a little bit of a, a, a tangent. Because, okay, so Tyler, uh, no, I'm, kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Go ahead, Jeff. I just tapped your line. <laughs> um, I tapped something. A um, little bit of a tangent. You, you brought up the idea of signing, and, and I've been sort of having this philosophical debate in my head for the last week since I headed out to RSA last week. Um, and you know what we're talking about is basically authentication. In, in the old military days, the way authentication was performed, and I, I worked in an office that was very closely al aligned to – the office that was responsible for producing the mostly paper systems that would do what we called at the time challenge and response. And that was the way, you know, like airstrikes were called in and you, you validated that, okay, that's really, the, you know, our guys calling in the coordinates, not the enemy. And we're going to really drop the bombs or, in, you know, in more modern terms, direct the drones. Um, what I'm what I'm curious about. So you know, we all talk about uh, authentication being, uh, you know, in terms of multi-factor or two-factor. There's there's three different forms: something you have, something you know, or something you are. I'm not aware that anything changes with that. Um, but I'm curious as to, you know, since you're an expert on PKI. PKI what what does the idea of uh, you know validating or, or or you know signing a signature, signing signing a key, how does that play into the whole concept of something you are, something you have, something you know? Is is that like a fourth factor? And and somebody who knows me has validated me. It's a tangent. I apologize, but I'm curious as what your thoughts are. No, it's it's actually a question that, that comes up quite a bit. So the way I often think of it is is the certificate and the accompanying key is, is something that should be in your possession. And, and while the certificate is typically something that we will include in a conversation or share ahead of time, the private key is is really the one thing that I should be the only entity in the universe with. So that, that's the, the something you have. Now, to make it really two-factor, I really need to protect that key somehow. Mm -hmm. So that's where something you know or something you are kind of comes into play. So a biometric protection of that key or a pin that protects the key, that that, that really kind of makes that true two-factor. I've got a private signing key. It's sitting inside of a, a TPM uh, encryption device, for instance, in my laptop. Uh, anyone that, that got my laptop would have that. But if there's a pin that is required to unlock the TPM to use the key, well, there's my two factors. You have to have that laptop with the key in it, and you have to have the pin to unlock it. I, and, I, and hopefully I, your pin is not zero, zero, zero. I, I was just going <laughs> to say, yeah. and, and implement that TPM with uh, too many incorrect guesses for that pin. Yes. Where yeah. it wipes yeah. the TPM. Well, that becomes very secure is what we call it, very secure. Yes. Right. Tyler. I'm going to change the pin to 1111. One, one, one. Right. 
Tyler. No, I, I was I was curious if there are uh, kind of implementations around kind of that intent uh, with. I'm going to say it a lot of the weighted uh, decision matrix charts, MI, ML, AI, those particular pieces. Are there different uh, things being kind of evaluated as far as how intent can be discovered, whether that's kind of pre pause lines, different uh, pieces with inside of the, the voice origination calls that weights that uh, a certain way so that it gets classified as potential spam, uh, or if it you know turns out to be spam, it weights it heavier and, and uh, different kind of classifications for that. Is there work around those particular pieces? Yeah, it, it, and some of that exists today. And, and the the big challenge, honestly, is is the fact that um, the they're they're doing all this without a lot of source identity. So so they they really kind of go into each call blindly. Uh, each of the, the the major service providers that are out there in the telecom space um, have typically some type of caller identity and analytics at play. And then you optionally have a consumer who has something on their mobile device as well. And, and they're okay. typically associated with the same data segment. Uh, but there, there are some interesting things that they could do. You know, typically around robocalls, for instance, um, you know, when they're recorded, they have the same um, audio tone, the same kind of um, messaging that's around there. And it's pretty easy for those systems to discern, oh, this thing that's making calls right now is doing it with a record. It's, it's, it's a robocall as opposed to a human that's going to speak differently, say things differently, or is each conversation is going to be unique. Um, and then a really interesting one I wasn't even aware of until a few months ago, some of the apps that you could put onto your phone, part of the, the, the licensing agreement that you uh, accept is you allow it to listen to your voicemail. And there, a lot of the robocalls don't care if you pick up, they leave a message anyway. Mm. Um, so what they do is they actually listen to the voicemail afterwards. And then it's kind of a lot like an email filter, looking for keywords. Do you need a loan? Are you looking for this? Are you selling this? Um, so it gives them some data points to work off of as well. And yeah, what could go wrong there? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, like, like anything, it's buried in the licensing agreement. Most people probably don't know it's turned on. Uh, yeah, some r real interesting stuff. Are, are these data sets being shared across multiple providers or these particular lists of you know known spam? Are these commonly shared or are these kind of isolated to single providers, single platforms, single applications? I'd say that the NSA probably has a list so they can exclude that from their, <laughs> from their data that they're collecting. Yeah, yeah I, um, I, I think the it's probably safe to say that they're not being shared only in that um, there are commercial entities outside of the, the providers themselves that, that sell services uh, to the providers, as well as the ones that are um, white labeling the software that you install on your phone. Um, so one provider may choose to go with uh, company A and, and their analytics and uh, another company selling them somewhere else. So it, it's possible that several providers have the same set of analytics because they, they have the same partner they're working with. Uh, but I don't necessarily think it's safe to assume that all providers are working with a, a massive data set in that regard. So, Mark, when, when we have it's shaken in stir, right, and it's implemented across the U.S., if I'm an organization and I want to basically robocall people and I just say who I am, right, does that validate both the number and the name? In other words, like, can I, 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 can I change either of those things or am I tied to with Shaken and Stir saying, I'm going to call you from this number and the name is always going to be this? Well, well, there's actually two different questions that you inadvertently asked here. So uh, the, the first one that comes to mind is, is the caller ID itself is just a number. Um, so the, the common caller ID that gets transmitted is simply what is the originator ID? And, and if you look through the specifications, there's actually mm -hmm. some other interesting things where uh, a lot like Active Directory, there, there's a GUID that's going to be assigned for every um, originator and every call that's made. Uh, and, and that's to really help with a, a big problem with traceback. So if you imagine the old days of the, the cop movie and having to keep the suspect on the line for three minutes yeah, and yeah. talking about the weather and the dog, well, that, that all kind of goes away. But because of digital communications, a lot of these things get stripped as they go from one provider to the mm -hmm. next. And it makes 
um, traceback very difficult, which also makes enforcement of robocalling and caller ID spoofing and, and, and crimes very difficult. So the new system will have an originator ID that kind of gets mapped from one provider to the next. So the, the traced act that I mentioned earlier in the, uh, in the US um, really kind of changes the timeline from days of performing these records requests down to about 15 minutes uh, through just about any, any phone call. Uh, what you see when you see a, a name come up, which was part of your question, uh, is, is, is actually an old fashioned um, analog service that when the caller ID shows up, much like you have a set of contacts in your phone and it says mom's calling or a coworker, the phone companies have services that they contract with that basically just have a, a white labeled list of phone numbers and friendly names uh, that get pulled from different information sources. So Shake and Stir won't do anything to allow someone to specify a name. It's simply the phone number that's associated with their origination. That's interesting. And if if the people who want a robocall are in other countries, like what prevents them from using digital services here in the U.S.? In other words, if I use a service like Skype or any other VoIP provider here in the yep. U.S., if that's valid, could I conceivably then be in another country and then perform robocalls? Uh, a absolutely. And, and what I suspect will probably happen is actually the inverse. If, if we imagine uh, every provider in the U.S. implements shake and stir, I'm a nefarious person and I want to be able to jump around on different caller IDs, I could just set up a SIP trunk to uh, yeah. a provider in another country that hasn't implemented shake and stir. And I can still put U.S. phone numbers in as the caller ID because remember, uh, if I'm a right. spammer, I, I can put whatever number I want in. I can yep. put the White House in. Um, so it, it doesn't it really matter where my, my SIP given. trunk yep. is. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, that the, the the bad guys, frankly, are, are they're just going to move to other places for a while. Mm. So that kind of begs the question: Why bother? Yeah, like there really is no solution to this problem, Mark. I'm concerned. Well, it, 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 it's it's trying to fix a a, a problem that's a, a little difficult to, to solve in one fell swoop. So this this mm. is uh, um, it's a first step. Um, I suspect uh, an interesting thing will happen. I, I think that there is um, going to be a period of time where each country is going to have a different adoption rate. We'll see potential. Uh, spammers moving to different places, much like when there's a new email filter, they'll adapt, they'll find some other way. Uh, will they potentially move their SIP trunk somewhere else? Sure. Uh, but an interesting effect kind of happens down the road. If I'm a, a, um, a country or a, a telephone provider and I'm not doing shake and stir because I'm not interested in it, or, or perhaps I'm going for a Panama style of, hey, I'm going to let spammers come here, I can make money not going to implement shake and stir. Well, at some point, legitimate businesses are going to have a problem. Once consumers get used to phone calls that are verified, much like even my mom knows when you go to a website, look for the, the green icon or look for the lock icon, yeah. like the consumer education's there. Well, all of a sudden, legitimate businesses are going to see their call answer rates drop off if they're working with a provider that's not implementing it or their provider is in a country that hasn't enforced it, those businesses will actually have a incentive to go to those providers and say, hey, you need to start implementing it. My calls aren't getting answered compared to my peers in other countries. So we may actually see business pressure for those places that are reticent to do it. And then that'll squeeze the, the spammers out as well. I have a question. Okay. Is it is it likely that providers will block unauthenticated numbers coming into the their networks, in other words, going to their customers, or is that a fantasy? Uh, it, it, it's not in the current specification uh, for a, a couple of reasons, but the primary thing is there's no mandatory global deployment of the signing operation. So if a provider dropped anything that's not signed, right now that's essentially going to be every phone call that's not originating on the well, network. Yeah. Could they potentially? Uh, absolutely. I mean, th there's nothing that um, is in this in the system that says, hey, you have to accept unsigned calls. The, the, the framework was written, calls should be signed. If they're not, they're unverified. Um, if a, a major provider in the U.S. just got tired of dealing with it and, and had enough complaints, could they magically flip a switch in their software that, that's doing the verification and say, rather than sending it and saying it's unverified, just drop it? Absolutely. That, that's a provider choice. Yeah. 
I can see that the likelihood would be low, but I'm just yep. wondering if it was technically possible. Yeah, you know, when you kind of start thinking about, you know, how, how can you be reasonably sure that the, the thing that's placing the phone call isn't the, the police department and their provider hasn't moved over or this zip trunk isn't configured right or it's a, a doctor calling. There, there's so many variables of, of um, yeah. leaping to what do we do with an unverified call. Um, I, I think it's probably farther down the, the road before we'll really see um, the ability to say the vast majority is trusted. Let's get rid of untrusted. Just, just like no one's turning off uh, access to non SSL protected sites. We still encourage people to go there um, and adoption numbers are increasing, but we still let the traffic through. Jeff? Hey, real quickly, you, you've said it several times now, and I know what you're talking about because I'm old, but for <laughs> our younger listening audience, could you briefly define or describe what a SIP trunk is? Sure. So SIP is a, a signaling protocol that's designed to essentially take a voice conversation, whether it's on a mobile device or an old landline, uh, and send it as network traffic. So just like you have HTTP traffic, you have SIP traffic. The interesting thing is because of the, the real-time nature of it, these are incredibly small packets, about 180 bytes. So there's actually some interesting challenges when you start doing things like cryptographic signing and identity in really small packets. But the intent when we're talking about SIPs and SIP trunks is having a voice conversation carried over a digital IP routed network. Yeah, and Mark, it, it kind of segues into my next question is that with all of the signing, it, like if we're signing and basically verifying the identity of both ends of the call, could we then take the next step to maybe exchange a different set of keys that encrypts that data uh, in transit to gain the privacy aspect uh, of our calls? And, and uh, are there implement, I know Signal has an implementation of that, right? Because there's a key exchange that, that happens w between your contacts uh, uh, to be able to exchange uh, SMS and text messages. Do, can that transfer into calls? Um, I, I think there's a potential. That I think the distinction, though, is when we're dealing with identity and, and, and signing, we're dealing with uh, a, a, an identity where um, the provider can see it, the, the information that's being routed. We're not obscuring details. Yeah. When we start talking about encrypting and, and obscuring the conversation, well, now we're really kind of talking about, I don't want my provider to see it. I don't want them to be able to the eavesdrop. Um, and, and now we're really talking end to end we're talking the originating device not the circuit that's going into a provider but mm -hmm. that computer that phone that landline encrypting and then being decrypted on the recipient um and, and there's nothing that shake and stir does that really touches the originating and the recipient end of the conversation it's all kind of happening in the middle so the best that we could potentially do is look at how do we encrypt from one place to the other the challenge, a lot like IP networks, is most providers don't necessarily know how the conversation is going to wind up. Like they don't necessarily know this is going to go to Sprint or this is Verizon. They simply know, got this number, it's not mine. I'm going to stick it on the network, send it off to the next hop and see where it goes. And then let's say the call was Sprint, but then that person forwarded their call to a, a Comcast VoIP. Well, then how do I handle the encryption key that I thought was going to be decrypted by Sprint? But now the call is sent to Comcast and it's a different decryption key. So there's a lot of complexity when we get into this middle ground. And I think that's why you see things like Signal where you're doing end-to-end, point-to-point mm -hmm. -point encryption, able to do that because they just say, I don't care about the provider being involved. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had to do a, a, a key exchange with our doctor office and pharmacy and you know all those <laughs> other places, right, to, to make sure yeah. those calls are encrypted. Exactly. And so, Mark, you're, you're speaking at uh, InfoSec World coming up on this exact topic. Hopefully, we didn't spoil too much of your talk. Nah. There's still stuff in your talk. That... No, no, no. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the, now how this all looks uh, conceptually. We'll talk a little bit about the nitty-gritty things that are behind the scenes. And, and then one of the things I love, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what are some of the potential ways that this could be exploited mm. um, and, and some mm. of the weaknesses. And, and we touched on a couple of them, but there's some other really interesting areas as well. 
Good. I, lo- awesome. I love when we talk about new features and automatically are starting to talk about how can we exploit <laughs> this, right? So yeah. that maybe we can fix this before <laughs> it gets implemented. So that's a, Ex- that's exactly. I love that. that. That's right. kind of how we got involved. Is is I uh, unceremoniously and unasked invited myself into the ecosystem and started providing feedback on their technical specifications, um, and, and said I've, I've got some ideas to share with you. So uh, like anything, you always just crash a party and you you, you hope for forgiveness later. Yep. Right. Reminds me very Sounds much of the like conversation. You've been forgiven. The, the conversation <laughs> we had with, and I can't remember her name, about the virtual world security yes. stuff. Kavya. Kavya. I uh, met her at, in, uh, at RSA in person. Because I'm still, I'm still waiting to join. Because you know. Oh, she's, she's. Oh yeah, she's working on it. <laughs> I know, she, I know she is. Kavya Perlman. Yeah, she's I, awesome. I'm, I'm waiting. She, yeah, she was absolutely awesome on the show. So. Yeah. Uh, any final questions for Mark? Oh yeah. Thank you. Uh, oh yeah, five oh, yeah. questions. We got to do five questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah go for questions. it. So, Mark, are you ready to play five questions with Security if Weekly? There's, if there, yeah, if there's not six, I'll do five. That's okay. There are there are only five, <laughs> and they're easy. There's no right or wrong answer, and one is multiple choice with only two possible answers. Ooh. Mark, All three right. words to describe yourself. Ah. Uh, workaholic passionate and geeky if you were a serial killer what would be your weapon of choice oh wow i i can choose one weapon uh you could choose, choose whatever you want yeah i mean if uh, it's okay. more than okay. one I, that's I, cool i think i i i'm uh, I, i'm a neat kind of guy i like things orderly i, I think i might go with acid all right interesting <laughs> if you wrote a book about cool. yourself what would the title be um <laughs> <laughs> I can't share that one with you. Yes, you uh, can. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 a longer story, but I'll I'll, I'll give you the, the the beginning of it. Basically, the the story is going to be not everyone can say that they've actually crawled back into their mother's womb. It, it, there's a bigger story there, I know. But, but you know what? That's, that's don't don't tell, tell us because that makes me want to read. Makes me want to read the book. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Mark in the popular. This is going to be me kind of going like this. <laughs> uh, okay. Mark in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Hmm. I, I think second. I'd like to know the intent. Right. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Oh, wait a minute. I, I thought you were going to go a different direction on that one. Um, only because of my, my recent promotion, I'm going to have to say at least Harrison Ford, uh, but mm, pre crystal skull Harrison Ford. Oh, good man. Um, yep, man. Yep. Agreed. And, um, nice it, 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 it's going to cross some lines, but I'm going to say Rebecca Romain. Fantastic. Oh. No, no, Ooh. wait, Rebecca Romain or Rebecca <laughs> Romain Stamos? Uh, pre Stamos, of okay, course. Okay, good. Just want to clarify. Just want to clarify. Stamos. Just clarifying because yes. there's yes. a, yes, yeah, yeah, it's important. It is. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. Thanks for having me. And uh, check out Mark's talk at InfoSec World this year, March 30th through April 1st. With that, we'll take a short break and come back with the security news for this week. Stay tuned.